Okay, I will go ahead and get started then uh, people can jump in if they need to, but thanks for coming today, everyone. Um, this is our fifth and last session um, on conversations on DEI in scientific events. Um, my name is Erin Doherty. You've probably seen me by now. Um, I'm one of the organizers along with the rest of the wonderful people um, on this list here. Um, and just a few things before we start today's session. Um, as you know, we've been basing this around the Inclusive Scientific Meetings Guide um, from 2018 that's now being updated. Um, and our presenter today is actually one of the authors, so we're really excited to, to have her here. Um, and just uh, while we're doing the presentations, just a few ground rules. Please mute yourselves during the presentation so we don't get any background noise. Um, make sure to be kind and respectful, especially during the breakout uh, room discussions and listen to other people's perspectives. Um, so our format will follow the format we've been using. Um, so first we're going to hear from Dr. AJ Lauer um, about her role in the supercomputing uh, committee chair. And then we're going to get into breakout room discussions and then any remaining times um, left, we'll address some questions that can be submitted via Slido. Um, so uh, Ifan posted in the chat, if you have questions, you can use that link to post the Slido um, and we can return to those at the end of uh, the session. So uh, I wanna give plenty of time for AJ. Um, so I will stop sharing now and AJ, um, I will just briefly introduce her. Uh, she's a scientist in CISL here at NCAR. Um, she was a chair of inclusivity um, on the supercomputing SC21 committee. So we're going to hear from her today about what awesome things she accomplished while she was on that committee. So thanks for joining us today, AJ, and um, feel free to take it away. All right, thanks, Erin. I'm going to share my screen and get my, all my windows settled here. So it always changes things around as you go. Um, okay. So, hi everyone. Um, as Erin said, my name is AJ Lauer. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Outreach, Diversity, and Education team lead in the Computational and Information Systems Lab, or CISL, at NCAR. Um, they asked me to give a little bit of an introduction about myself. Uh, and my background and, and how I came to this work. And so uh, I actually started doing diversity and inclusion work when I was in middle school. There was an organization in my community called the Association for the Rights of Citizens with Handicaps. We did monthly gatherings for teens with disabilities, as well as um, presentations from I think second grade through high school and occasionally in the corporate world and for adults um, called Differences Gotta Have Them that were all about um, diversity and inclusion, although we didn't really call it that at that time. So I've been doing DNI work for a long time. It's always been part of my career. It's something that I care very deeply about. Um, and I really, you know, even if it's not in my position description, it's something that I do wherever I am. So the requisite explanation of my educational background, I got my bachelor's in psychology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I have a master's degree in higher education student affairs from Florida International University. And I just recently got my doctorate in interdisciplinary leadership studies from Creighton University. So this picture is, um, of a recent set of headshots that I gifted to myself when I finished my doctorate. So there's my pretty picture out the back of NCAR um, as part of just, you know, let's let me do something fun to celebrate having, you know, accomplished this milestone. In my everyday life, um, something that's really, really important to me, of course, is my kids. And so uh, they, <laughs> as part of the supercomputing 2021 story, is this little bunny named Carrot Bunny. My kids were very worried that I was not going to have enough snuggles for the week while I was gone at the conference. And so they sent me to the conference with this little stuffed bunny. And um, I took the bunny all over St. Louis. I took pictures of him having adventures. And that's what that middle picture is. Uh, my kids are really important because they are two white boys. And I'm very cognizant of the privilege that they will carry in this world. I'm cognizant of the financial privilege that we already have in our family. And so 
my work, as I think about it, it is, you know, trying to make the world a better place for everyone, um, including for my children, but also trying to make sure that the children that I'm raising are capable of continuing to make the world a better place and a more inclusive place, even as they are white men and, and with all of the privileges that they will hold. And so um, the little corner of the world right now that I'm specifically working in is high performance computing. That means um, my doctoral research focused on the career field of high performance computing and how to make it more welcoming for people who are currently underrepresented in the field, as well as uh, I help run an internship program at NCAR that has a goal of increasing diversity in HPC. Um, I do a lot of education and outreach work in various ways with various people again, with that goal. Um, and I had the opportunity to be the inclusivity chair for the 2021 supercomputing conference. And that's what we are going to be talking about today. So what we are doing today, um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about time and place. If you've attended the other sessions, our other presenters have talked about how important it is to acknowledge where you are and what is happening in the world while you are doing diversity and inclusion work. And um, the time and place of the work that we did for SC21 was extremely important. So I want to give you all kind of a grounding in what the conference is and, and what was happening while we were planning the conference. And then for the rest of the presentation, we're going to follow the format of that guide to scientific uh, inclusive scientific meetings. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we did while we were planning the meeting to make the meeting inclusive. We're going to talk about what we did during the meeting to make the meeting as inclusive as it could be. And we're going to talk about some of the things that we've done after the meeting to continue the work and help it um, keep moving forward, even as our amazing little committee has disbanded. So about the supercomputing conference. Um, SC has been around for 34 years. It is sponsored on alternate years by IEEE and the ACM. And at its peak in 2019, we had 13,000 attendees. Uh, in the last couple of years with the virtual and hybrid environment, of course, we've had smaller attendance just because of the pandemic. Um, but it'll be really interesting to see what happens over the next few years and if the conference rebounds or if they decide to stay smaller or what's going to happen there. SC is not a very diverse place. Um, it is extremely white male dominated. Uh, that we estimate that there are 13 to 18% women attendees in the technical program. We do not have good data about the diversity in the exhibits area um, because we just don't collect those demographics very well. The conference had set a goal in 2017, I think 2016, 2017 of having 20% uh, representation of women at the conference by 2020. Um, I don't think that we made that, but we also had the pandemic happen. So I don't know if it's totally fair to hold the conference accountable to that because of chaos. So, um, but we're, we're still working on it. The conference first started working on diversity from that lens of gender because we had an organization called the Women in High Performance Computing Group who uh, really started to advocate for that and who joined the committee and said, hey, we want the committee to start working on this. Uh, they were the first people to have the conference create an inclusivity committee. The inclusivity committee has only existed for four years. It was two years and then there was a gap year and then um, two more years. So it's a fairly young initiative within the conference. There are other people who have been working around it. Um, Linda Ackley, who's here today, has done a lot of work in HPC around diversity and inclusion kind of around the conference. Um, but the conference itself has really only been deliberately addressing it through a formal committee for about four years. You can see the nice little logo of SC21 in St. Louis, Missouri was where they were hoping to hold it and did end up holding the conference. So our amazing committee, <laughs> here is the list of everybody that I got to work with on my SC21 inclusivity committee. Some of these folks are here today. And so I hope when we get into small groups that um, they will all introduce themselves as such so that everybody else can ask questions and learn about what their experiences were like and what things they worked on. Um, there are two things that I want to point out about this list. For one thing, it's a lot of people. And so 
in the next slides, I'm going to show you that we did a ton of work for SC21. Part of the reason that we were able to do so much was because we had such a huge dedicated committee of people. Um, I think almost every single person on this list was so dedicated to inclusivity specifically. They were so excited. They really showed up to our meetings, to the meetings with other parts of the committee and during the conference itself. So, um, you know, I would say if you can have a big group of committed people, you can do big things. And we did do big things. The other thing that I want to point out, um, is this box here. These are our inclusivity liaisons for all of the different subcommittees within the conference. And so we had the luck of having the general chair say he wanted us to have inclusivity touch points with every single subcommittee. That meant that we were able to help those committees figure out ways in which they could bring inclusivity into the work that they were doing. We were able to nudge them in some places uh, and really help them make sure that inclusivity was part of the whole conference instead of just, you know, this little committee over here who were concerned about it. Um, if you have the ability, if you are the person who's making a conference committee and you can make this happen, I, I would highly recommend it. I think it was really helpful for us in um, just lifting the whole conference. So this is a timeline of things that happened in the world and things that were happening in the conference. This is deliberately a very busy slide. I'm not going to walk you through every single item on this slide, but I wanted to give you some context that it was a very busy time. <laughs> um, there was a lot going on in the world in the diversity and inclusion realm. We were in a pandemic. We had a lot of work that we wanted to do within the conference. And so um, it's just important to kind of keep that in mind. There are a couple of things that I do want to highlight on here. Um, one is that I joined, I was asked to join the committee about five days after the pandemic was officially declared in the United States. And that um, really played into whether or not I, you know, I was like, whoa, should I do this? We're heading into a pandemic. This seems like a lot. Um, I did decide to do it, obviously. Um, and another thing is that on May 25th, when George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a couple weeks later, we had our first, my first quarterly committee meeting in which I was presenting to the rest of the, the large, the executive group for the conference about inclusivity issues. And um, I believe that when we are leaders, and especially when we are leading in the diversity and inclusion realm, it's really important to make priorities clear and to help everyone else understand why it's important the work that we are doing. And so at that June 2nd meeting, when I did my presentation about what we were doing as a committee, which wasn't much at that point because I had only been in the role for a month, um, I pointed out to the committee that Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson, which is right next to St. Louis. There were protests in Ferguson, just like there were protests at that time in Minneapolis and starting to go around the country. Our whole conference committee needed to be thinking about diversity and inclusion at our conference because absolutely, especially the people of color, but anybody from an underrepresented background was going to be thinking about diversity and inclusion while they were in that space in St. Louis specifically. And I wanted to make sure that the rest of the conference committee knew that that was the precept that I was operating under in trying to make the conference inclusive. I was trying to create a safe space within the conference so that if people didn't feel safe in the city of St. Louis, at least when they walked in the door, they could breathe a sigh of relief when they were in our space. And it was important for me to have the rest of the committee know that that was where I was coming from right out of the gate. Another thing that I want to point out that really impacted how I thought about inclusivity at the conference was that my family and I all contracted COVID in early 2021. Unfortunately, I developed long COVID after that experience. So I was actually quite sick through all of 2021. And that meant that when we were talking about, should we require vaccines? Should we not require vaccines? I was saying, yes, absolutely. How can we have a conference where we're risking people's lives and risking their minds um, 
that's unacceptable to me. <laughs> it was why we decided to move all of the inclusivity events completely virtual. We were very sensitive to the fact that underrepresented populations often receive have worse outcomes from COVID. And I didn't want our committee to be responsible for um, folks coming to an event that could end up being a super spreader. And so um, that my own personal experience with COVID and with long COVID had a huge impact on how we were thinking about events that we were hosting at the conference. So what did we do? So much. Before the conference, so on these next three slides, anything that was a new initiative that our committee did is marked with a star. Um, and so these are things that we did before the conference. We got the option at registration for folks to include their pronouns on their name tags. We uh, ran a new volunteer program. So Heya Nam uh, actually was part of the committee before I was. <laughs> she put in a proposal to the conference to run a new volunteer solicitation program. SC, like many conferences in the past, was run by a, if you know someone you can get on the conference committee kind of paradigm and she said well this is not a good way to bring in diverse voices this is not a good way to bring in younger professionals we should have a formal solicitation process where people can um, self-elect to be on the committee similar to some other conferences that have more of a dni focus and so um, she ran that program for the first year we increased the number of new volunteers by like 50 percent uh, above the previous year, which was huge. We got some amazing people out of it who were earlier career, who were from different diverse backgrounds. Um, it was really a huge benefit to the whole conference to start that program. We did a lot of work with communications. Our communications liaison was active from the start. She made sure that there was, you know, we were thinking about different ways that high performance computing is used in the humanities, not just in um, hard sciences, those kinds of things. We offered diversity and inclusion training to the committee. Unfortunately, we didn't do it until October, right before the conference, but uh, it was hugely impactful. We presented to, I think, 50 or 60 people in a hybrid environment. We focused specifically on diversity in conference settings. We presented some background information about previous experiences regarding inclusivity at the conference from um, survey information and stories shared by my committee. Um, it was really impactful, and I think that that was, again, good for people to get grounded in the place and in why we were doing the inclusivity work that we were doing. The CARES Committee was a new initiative that came out of the tech program, and the CARES Committee is a group of people who are available at the conference to help people navigate through making a formal complaint or um, registering that they had had an issue at the conference, and um, that was really cool because it, it it gave people somebody to talk to. I think there was a lot of feedback about, you know, well, this bad thing happened at the conference and I don't know who to tell. Uh, now we have a mechanism for people to, to let the conference know so that we can address issues. And then metrics, we worked a little bit with the tech program on addressing, you know, whether or not their program reviewers were from diverse backgrounds and those kinds of things. Some initiatives that we didn't get to, um, were inclusion at the committee meetings. SC has a lot of committee meetings and they really like to have them in person. And there were definitely some issues around the in-person committee meetings. We were thinking a lot about inclusivity for the formal conference, but we weren't necessarily thinking about it for when we were all together in a smaller group. Walking a quarter mile to a surprise meal may not work for someone with asthma. And we need to be thinking about those things while we're planning the committee meetings too, because you might be excluding people who maybe uh, can't eat certain things or walk distances and things like that. Um, it was suggested to us that we have not only the ability to have your pronouns on your name tags, but also some sort of movable option for your pronouns, such as uh, stickers or a pin, so that if, say, a non-binary or trans person enters into a conversation and realizes it may not be safe for their pronouns to be out there, that they could flip those around and hide it for their own safety. And so that's something that I hope to see happen in the future. The other thing is that through our liaison with the exhibitor subcommittee, we got diversity and inclusion and workforce added as topics for the um, exhibitor forum, which is like a mini conference for exhibitors, but nobody submitted any topics for that area. So it was something that we got on the website, <laughs> but didn't actually happen. So I'm hoping that they 
put it in this year and I will be submitting something. I will make sure that it happens um, or people from my committee will be making sure that we have that as part of what happens moving forward. So during the conference, we also had a lot of things going on. We had an inclusivity office for the first time. The inclusivity office was amazing. It was super friendly. We had a giant Black Lives Matter flag. We had a giant LGBTQ flag. Um, you could watch people walk into our office and their shoulders would drop when we would excitedly welcome them in, when they would see that there was visible signs that they were welcome there. Um, it was just a really powerful kind of a magnetic space within the conference. The student and early career programs we have these amazing programs at SC for early career people, which is like professional development, networking, all that kind of stuff. And we also have a few hackathons um, and educational experiences for students to participate in prior to the conference. And so those went extremely well and were, as always, really inclusive and really fun. Communications was really interesting. We did a ton of communications actually during the conference. And so um, because our communications liaison actually came on site, she was wandering around the conference and doing interviews with people. She was weaving an in inclusivity into conversations that she was having with um, people that you wouldn't have necessarily thought about talking about inclusivity. And so because she was so active and she was on site, she just made sure that inclusivity was there throughout a lot of the communications that happened during the week, which was um, just really neat to see how she, she just very tactfully and beautifully managed that. We had our first ever diversity and inclusion talk. Dr. Chandra Daly um, presented for us about diversity in computing. That was the first time ever we had the highest attendance or one of the highest attendance of any session in the entire conference for that talk. So it was, it was well appreciated by the community. We had non-gendered restrooms for the first time. Um, that, yep, it happened. Um, we also had affinity groups. So we hosted space for Indigenous people, Hispanic and Latinx, women, people with disabilities, African-American and African, and I think I'm missing one, LGBTQ. Um, we hosted space for those folks to get together and find one another and network and create some support. Uh, and it was the first time that that happened and the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. People were so thrilled to be able to talk to one another at the conference. We also hosted a Discord server. Um, our committee kind of took that on at the last minute. It was like October and we were like, oh, there's not going to be any kind of focused social media space for the conference. We were planning to do a, a little separate thing, but it'll actually be cheaper to run a Discord server. So we're just going to run a Discord server for the whole conference. And so at the last minute, we put together a whole Discord server with moderators and session types and the affinity groups were held there. Um, it was really an incredible resource for people during the conference. Some things during the conference that I would like us to work on. So we had non-gendered restrooms, but the signage was not amazing. Um, we didn't get the signage finalized until the Thursday before the conference due to a lot of factors. And so um, we just need to kind of make that better so that it, it was kind of not great. Um, accessibility and safety at events. We had this incredible event on Thursday night. Um, at a really cool venue that had like adult sized slides and cargo nets and things like that. But we also had some people with disabilities who attended that, uh, people in wheelchairs who were not able to enjoy the event as much as people who were able-bodied and able to climb on those things. And so I just, we need to keep working on that. And language around inclusivity, I would like to see the conference tighten that up a little bit to make sure that all of the committee members when we're talking about inclusivity are using the same language and conveying the same message. Uh, with when we're talking about it. Um, so after the conference, there were a few things that happened. Uh, one is that we had some survey questions in the, um, in the post survey, which I will show you in a moment. The affinity groups and discord stayed open through January. It wasn't highly used during that time, but it was a way for people to continue connecting with one another. People were sharing jobs. They were still talking to the affinity groups and getting connected there. Um, it was a very low effort thing for us to do, but it did have an impact on folks. 
And we provided fe feedback for future conferences. Um, the previous inclusivity committees hadn't really left very much behind for us to work from. And so uh, I've been working really closely with the next two years worth of inclusivity chairs to make sure that they know all of the things that we did and they have all of the resources from all of the stuff that we did so that they can build on it. Because as we all know, inclusivity is a long game. If we restart every year, we're not going to make any progress. So um, we've been providing a lot of feedback for future conferences so that they can keep building on the work that we did. Something that we still need to work on um, is demographics and putting survey results on the website. Um, this is something that we were told that they wanted to make happen. But then when we were talking about how to actually do it, it turned out there are a lot of politics around it. A lot of people don't want that information out there. I believe that we should be as transparent as possible, um, but other people were concerned about it for various reasons. And so we're still navigating kind of the politics of what demographics and what survey results should go on the website for future years. Um, and then we now have a steering inclusivity committee. So steering is a body of people who provide oversight for all of the whole SC conference series. And we now have a subcommittee of people who are specifically focused on inclusivity at the conference. That wasn't something that I started. It was something that was started by someone else during 2020. Um, but that's something that I'm participating in through this year uh, that has had, we've done some good things with that group of people. As promised, here are the post-survey questions. These are gnarly, I apologize for the busy slide, but what's important about them is that they're kind of in three categories. The first category is how welcoming was SC for various people? So if you ask that question and you say, how welcoming was the conference for white women, women of color, men of color, people with disabilities, um, international attendees, if you match those questions to the demographic questions that you ask on the survey, you can do an analysis to find out if there's a difference between how those groups of people believe, how welcoming people believe that the conference is for themselves versus how everybody else thinks it's welcoming. So if you see that there's a major disparity between how welcoming white men think that the conference is for men of color, um, you can, you know that you need to do a little bit more awareness building. Um, and so that, that just gives a little bit of perspective on not only how do people feel, how welcoming do people feel that it was for themselves, but also what is their perception of the conference for everyone else? The second set of questions is designed to be very actionable. These are things that if you get a low score on these, <laughs> you know that you have something to work on. So, um, SC provides a clear policy on ethics and expected behavior. If you get a low score on that for your conference, you know that you need to make that ethics statement or those expected behaviors much more visible to your conference attendees. You need to have them sign off on them before they attend or something to help people be aware that those that's part of what they're expected at the conference. Um, I'm comfortable bringing up issues at SC without fear that it will negatively impact my career. So there, that is justification for the CARES Committee, that group of people who are, you know, a, a neutral body of people who are available at the conference that you can go to and you can talk to about anything negative that might happen at the conference. And people know that they can talk to them without it having a negative impact on their career. That's really important for getting feedback about things that are actually happening at the conference. Um, and then the last question that we used was how likely are you, if at all, to recommend attending SC to a friend who asks? And that is just a general, how did we do? Do you feel like this is a good conference? Do you feel like this is a bad conference? Did you have a good time? Did you have a bad time? You can pretty much tell that with that one simple question. So, um, you know, it's a good way to get a barometer on people's feeling of inclusive, being included at the conference. These questions were designed um, off of a culture survey, like an organizational culture survey question. I used these in my, my doctoral research to look at the culture within the whole um, field of high performance computing, and it was extremely interesting. Um, the result, I can't share for, with you what the results were for this for SC, um, because we're still holding that close, um, but I can tell you that they were really interesting. 
So if you are planning a conference and you're looking to assess how you did, um, this will be a good set of questions to use. We are planning to do a supplemental for the inclusive scientific meetings guide about these questions. So um, keep your eyes peeled for that. And that is my very fast talk about all of the amazing things that we did at SC. I'm sure I missed things, um, but that's kind of the overview of all the amazing things that my committee did. So the questions that I had for you all today were for the event that you were planning or that you're hoping to plan or influence, what are some of the low hanging fruit DEI items that you think would be easiest to address first? So for us, that was pronouns on name tags and non-gendered restrooms. Non-gendered restrooms did not end up being as low hanging fruit as we thought it was going to be, <laughs> but it was a good thing that we thought you know, was an obvious thing that the conference should have. And so um, I encourage you to start thinking there, what are easy things that you can do to influence the inclusivity on your, at that conference? Um, because that'll give you some, some early wins that you can build off of as you're planning. What might be stretch goals? What might be more difficult things that you could do? Um, I think running the Discord server ended up being a last minute stretch goal. We totally nailed it um, because we were excited about, because we were passionate about, because we had the skills to do it. And then the second question is, what resources can you bring to bear to support these changes? Um, for us, it was that vol new volunteer process. A lot of the people on our committee were new volunteers for SC. Um, it was you know, leveraging connections within the computing community to learn who we should have as a speaker. Those kinds of things can really help make it easier to do diversity and inclusion work. Uh, when you think about kind of outside the box resources, as well as the resources that you have within the conference. So um, hopefully you all will have some ideas in those rounds as you discuss with one another. And that concludes my talk. Awesome. Thanks so much, AJ. There was a lot of good information in there. Um, I think we're all probably still digesting this, but yeah. um, there are some really, really useful tips in there. So thank you for sharing your, your knowledge and your experience. Um, very helpful. So um, we have about 25 minutes left. So we're going to break into breakout rooms now and we'll return at four or five and then have the last 10 minutes for just general discussion and questions. So I'll see some of you in the breakout rooms. And do you need help moving or? Hi, Patricia. Everybody just went into a breakout room. And do you need help getting to your breakout room?
Hey, I think we have just about everyone back. So I hope you all had very productive breakout rooms. Um, I know we probably could have talked for longer and, and we, you know, hit some bigger issues. So um, we can turn it over to the Slido now and just have a general group discussion to address some of those questions on Slido. So um, Ifan, would you like to share, can you share the Slido, um, your screen? Or yes, definitely. Like okay, thanks. Okay. And yeah, if you have more questions, feel free to post them in there. Yep. So, okay. So, one second. Screen. Can everyone see the question? Yep. Yep. Looks good. Great. Cool. So, yeah, we can just start with these questions. If more come up, we'll address those. Um, so first question, how does the inclusivity steering committee interact at the SC inclusivity, interact the SC inclusivity committee? How are they different? Um, can the SC inclusivity committee act independently or does it depend on the steering committee? How do we know who's part of the steering committee and how are they selected to be a part of that? So I think that's for um, AJs and others who are on that committee. Yes, so there's a, there's a lot here. Um, so the SC, steering committee is a group of um, people from all across the field of high performance computing. There are people who have traditionally been involved in the individual conference planning committees. And um, I believe that they have to apply to be on the steering committee. There is a list of people who are on the steering committee on the website for the conference series. So you can look up and see who's on there. Um, as far as how the steering subcommittee for inclusivity interacts with the conference ones, um, we right now on that subcommittee have three years worth of inclusivity chairs. So I'm on the committee as the past chair, this year's SC22 inclusivity chair is on the committee and the SC23 chair is on that committee. So we've got three years worth of inclusivity committee members, chairs, who are um, also part of that steering subcommittee. And so that means that we have a really active role in um, providing recommendations to steering about what we think actually will work and what we think that the community needs. Um, our Subcommittee is made of people who are really active in DNI in the HPC community um, that were recommended from various places. We kind of like brought a big list of people and we tried to make sure that we had some good representation across identities um, to form that subcommittee. So um, SC inclusivity, the annual inclusivity committees can act independently, but they receive guidance from steering about certain things that they do. Now, both the inclusivity committees and the steering subcommittee are so new that there's, it's not like there are edicts coming down saying, you must do this at the conference. We're still very much just developing everything together at this point, um, but we're hoping to get to a point where we have a pretty set um, makeup for what an inclusivity feel at supercomputing actually is. So um, that is very much in development at this point. Cool. Thanks, AJ. Um, so the next question is asking, how did you handle the non-gendered restrooms, given that the conference center restrooms were likely gendered? And I had more questions on this too, as to like why, why this was more of a challenge than initially thought. So we, um, we ended up just selecting restrooms that were in very central locations um, where we thought that there would be a lot of traffic and where we thought that um, everybody in the conference would benefit from just having an easy restroom to use. Um, so I, I, I actually don't know what gender assignment the restrooms were that we used <laughs> um, because I had never been in the conference center until the signs were already up. So I don't even know the answer to that question totally. Um, it was harder than we thought it was going to be because we just couldn't get them to commit to what rooms that they were going to be and to the fact that we were going to have them in the first place. So um, it took us like six months of emailing and emailing and emailing saying like, hey, what rooms are we gonna use for this? How are we doing this? Uh, and then eventually all of a sudden it happened the week before the conference, so. Uh, 
sorry to interrupt. There is a follow-up question. Uh, okay. Which is uh, also with the conference being in Texas next year, how will its law impact this? I don't know. I don't We're know. still trying to figure that out. Um, Texas, yeah. So part of what is tricky about supercomputing is that for the length of the conference, we have the fastest internet in the world set up in that conference center. And so there are very real infrastructure concerns about where we can host the conference. And so we end up having to go to really large conference centers that are willing to let us like drill holes in their walls to set up this internet um, and to run the fiber from outside the conference center and things like that. So um, it gets a little bit complicated with how do you balance, and I see that this is a question lower, how do you balance the infrastructure needs of the conference with uh, diversity and inclusion issues when you're trying to choose where to go? Um, that is something that we are still working on. <laughs> um, the, the contracts are signed at least five years out. And so in a couple of instances, you know, things have come up that have made things worse in the cities when we already had the contract signed. And so we're still having conversations within the inclusivity steering subcommittee about how we want steering to handle those kinds of things. Uh, for the person who asked it, yes, absolutely. Locations can defer, deter diversity at conferences if the city and state doesn't feel safe. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Virginia, did you raise your hand in on purpose? Yeah, so I was thinking about the like non-gender groceries. So I did not attend supercomputing, but I've attended another um, conference, which was a student affairs conference. And they take the traditionally women's restroom and they convert that because a women's restroom generally has all stalls mm -hmm. um, and, and not urinals. And so I think, um, you know, some people might feel uncomfortable with the urinals and you're not like in a private little space there. Um, so I think that's what they did at the conference I went to in the past. Yeah, my impression of this conference center was that they all had stalls. Um, but again, I don't know what gender restroom I was using when I used the non-gendered restroom. I very intentionally only used the non-gendered restroom. I didn't go in anywhere else, so I don't actually know. Uh, Maria? Hi everyone. Yes, I just wanted to comment something regarding, you know, locations that are inclusive, in, that are not very inclusive uh, to host the conference. Um, if if we stop going to those locations, um, well, let me say it in a different way. There's value in going to those locations that are problematic from DEI perspective and other perspectives, because you can bring the message of DEI to those places and you can help educate people and, and you can just, uh, you know, spread knowledge and, and help the communities there. Um, and, you know, for some of those cities, I remember my first SE at, in Las Vegas, it was a big deal for them to host SE. And they got exposed to many things that they haven't had, they haven't been exposed before. Um, so I think there's value in that. Yeah, Maria, that's a fantastic point. You know, as a C and other conferences do more and more outreach to traditionally underserved groups in their fields, um, that's a way to to uplift those groups within those spaces that we go to if we're going to places that aren't as supportive yes. too. Yes. <laughs> that's a great point, Maria. Thank you. So just to kind of piggyback off of Maria, this is Linda. Uh, be, between the gap before you, AJ, Kelly Gaither had that role. Mm -hmm. And that's where we developed, but the pandemic hit. And so we didn't actually fully create the concept that we wanted to. And that was what the HPC and the city hackathon mm -hmm. helps us do. And that's an outreach activity the intent was to connect with the the, the, peop the communities around us because that year we were going to be in Atlanta before we were told no. And the idea was to, to, to do a hackathon and activities around using HPC to solve and look at problems and challenges in those communities. And that is actually the heart of what Jamie Powell leads with the HPC in the city. Mm -hmm. And that was a very intentional um, program that 
Kelly and I kind of developed, I didn't stay on the, I didn't actually stay on the committee as a way to think about the impact, like Maria mentioned, if we go to a city because we have to go there because of infrastructure, what is it we're doing? What do we leave behind? How can we actually help the community by bringing something at this scale to the community? So mm -hmm. just uh, that is why HPC and the city was actually created. Yep, and HPC in the city is awesome. It's such a cool, cool, cool program. Hmm. I would love to continue this discussion, um, but out of the interest of everyone's time, uh, we should probably end there. And I think it was a great point to end on about what are we bringing to communities when we're thinking about, you know, mm -hmm. conferences and, and diversity. Um, so I think that's a great little nugget to take with us. Um, but I'm sorry we can't continue this, um, but thanks everyone for participating today. It was just a really valuable discussion and um, I think there's tons of ideas um, that I definitely learned about. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming, everybody. Yeah, thanks, AJ. Really appreciate it.